We're going to talk about stoichiometry a little bit, and I just want to make sure that everybody understands how to use dimensional analysis and what the purpose of it is. So I'm just going to really quick review with you the setup for dimensional analysis so that you feel confident you know what you're doing, okay? Um, so here's the thing. First of all, like I said, I call them fences. Um, I just think that's easier to say than dimensional analysis, all right? So I'm gonna draw one for you right here, a fence, that's what I think it looks like. I'm sure my lines that one's super crooked, but you'll be able to deal. Okay, here's the point of the fence, okay? Usually what happens is we're given information about one substance in the balance equation, and we wanna find out information about a different substance in the balance equation. In a lot of cases, the information we're given is grams, okay? So, oops, hold on, I keep pressing on me. There we go. So, a lot of times, we are given um, grams of substance, like I'm just gonna call it A, okay? Um, so, for example, if we had a balanced equation, let's say that was reactant A, plus reactant B produces C plus D, okay? So we'll just use um, those letters, okay, to generically look at um, how this would be set up in a fence, okay? So a lot of times what happens is you're given information about one of your reactants, and then you're asked, okay, well then how much product does that make? And you have to switch between the two substances, okay? So I'm going to put some fake coefficients in here. I'm just going to put a 2 in front of the A for a second so that we can see how we would use that in a sense, okay? So now we have 2A plus B produces C plus D, okay? And hopefully you can see that. So I'm going to erase this um, to make it a little bit bigger. And usually what happens is this. Usually in a problem, we're told we have a certain number of grams of substance A, okay? And then we're asked to find grams of a different substance, okay? Which this time we'll say is gonna be substance D. So where does the fence come in? Well, this is basically just a really fancy way to change units, okay? The whole point of the fence is you're given one piece of information that you're gonna manipulate unit by unit to get to a different piece of information, okay? So, if we wanna find grams of D, and the only thing we have is grams of A, then we need to connect those two substances. The only way they connect is through the mole ratio that's in the balanced equation. That is the only connection between those two substances. We know that for every two moles of A, we have one mole of D, okay? So since we have grams, and our only connection between them is moles, then the first thing we need to do is we need to change grams to moles. So I always say, whatever's top left needs to go bottom right, okay? So if grams of A is top left, grams of A is gonna go down here, but this time, it's gonna be the molar mass off the periodic table, okay? So we need to get rid of grams and switch to moles, which we're gonna do using the molar mass. You know molar mass means the number of grams in one mole of a substance, so that means up top is one mole of substance A, okay? And now, grams cancels out. So grams are gone, we have moles of A, which is good because that means we're gonna be able to use our mole ratio, okay? That mole ratio right here, see if I can do this with my stylus, is like the key step to stoichiometry, all right? So what we need to do now, again, if it's top left, it goes bottom right so that it'll cancel out, okay? So we're gonna use our balanced equation. We have moles of A, okay? We're currently on substance A, but we wanna to get to substance D. 
So what we're going to do there is we're going to use our balanced equation to put in our numbers. In the balanced equation, for every 2 moles of A, so we're going to put a 2 there, we produce 1 mole of substance D. That's your mole ratio. That's what we use to switch substances. Okay? Now, again, is that the final unit we want? No, we were asked grams of D. So what do we need to do? Same thing. We need to get from moles to grams. So if it's top left, it needs to go bottom right. Okay, so we can connect moles to grams, again using the molar mass, this time of substance D. Okay, so for every one mole of D, we would look up the molar mass of D, which will be in grams, right? And then that allows you to cancel out moles. So moles of A are gone, moles of D are gone, and what we're left with is grams of D, which is exactly what we want. So the whole point on this fence, okay, people, like I always say people are always plugging in numbers, like multiplying, dividing. The thing is, the numbers aren't the point of the fence. The point of the fence is to be able to switch from one unit to another using conversion factors that we know, such as molar mass or the mole ratio. So you really have to take the time to set up your units first so that everything cancels out and you're getting, like you keep using a conversion factor to get closer and closer to the unit that you want. And that's the point of the fence, okay? So putting that in context now, Here's an example. How many grams of KNO3? Oh, you can't see that. Just kidding. Here, scroll down. There you go. How many grams of KNO3 are needed to produce 55.0 grams of O2 using the balanced equation below? Okay? So, a couple of things. First of all, you know, it's not a bad idea to highlight. That's a small highlighter. I want to make it bigger. Um, it's not a bad idea for you to highlight the information you're given, okay? Whatever you're given in the problem, whatever number you're given, that's what goes top left of your fence. That's what starts your fence up. So we have 55.0 grams of O2, okay? And then what are we being asked to find? We're being asked to find grams of KNO3, okay? So we're going to have to go from grams of O2 to grams of KNO3, all right? Again, how do we do that? Using the units. So look, I just want to show you. I'm not even going to write in any numbers, and I know my lines are crooked, but it's okay. Um, we need to get rid of grams of O2 so that we can get to the mole ratio, which means we're going to use the molar mass to go from grams of O2 to moles of O2, okay? Once we have moles of O2, we're gonna, oops, that's really bad. Once we have moles of O2, we're gonna be able to use our mole ratio to go moles of O2 to the substance we want, which is KNO3. So we'll put moles of KNO3 up there. Then, we finally have the substance we want, but we don't have the units we want. So we're going to have to go from moles of KNO3 to grams of KNO3. Okay? And you guys, if you look, other than the number I was given in the problem, I haven't written a single number down yet. All I've done is set up my units so that I know where all the numbers go. And if you take the time to do that, your numbers fall in place, okay? So now I'm going to use the molar mass because there's a connection between moles and grams. Off the periodic table, each oxygen weighs 16, but it's O2, which means there's two of them. So that's going to be 32.00 for every one mole of O2. Then we're going to go O2 to KNO3 moles using our balanced equation. So find these on your balanced equation, okay? And for every four moles of KNO3, there are five moles of O2. That's where those numbers come from, 
okay? Now, again, look at everything that cancels. Grams of O2, gone. Moles of O2, gone. Moles of KNO3, gone. All right, but we need numbers here. Again, we go back to molar mass. That's our connection between moles and grams. One mole of KNO3, if you add it up, this is 39.10, 14.01, and then uh, three oxygens is 48. I did it before I started filming, so that's 101.11 grams, okay, of KNO3. All right, now I want to talk to you about how to get an answer on your calculator, all right, um, in a way that I think is easiest. First of all, I mentioned it on your welcome sheet. Um, a scientific calculator is fine, but I will tell you a graphing calculator is better, okay? So if you are working this summer and you have a little extra money, you know, usually those calculators are on sale during the summer um, and it, it wouldn't be a horrible idea to buy one, okay? Um, if, you know, I mean, they are expensive. I don't own one. Um, they're usually like a little bit more than a hundred bucks. Uh, if you um, don't want to spend a hundred dollars but do want one, like sometimes you can find them used like on Craigslist or eBay or even check a pawn shop or something like that um, because sometimes they do have them and you're able to get them at a discount. Okay, otherwise I do have a couple for you to use. It's not such a big deal in the beginning of the year for this type of stuff, but when we get to some later topics, it's easier to um, have one of those graphing calculators. Uh, the other thing I'll say is for the AP exam, you want to be practicing with the calculator you're going to use during the exam because you don't want to be learning how to use that particular calculator while you're taking the exam. So something to think about, but anyway, a scientific calculator will do. So just like in math class, when numbers are next to each other, it means multiply. And when they're on, like one's on top and one's on bottom, it means divide. So the way that I approach this is I multiply all the way across first. So I would do 55.0 times 1 times 4 times 101.11. And then I hit equals. And I have a huge number right now because that was everything on top. Then what I do with this calculator, if you're using a graphing calculator, what I would recommend you do is just hit divide, make a parenthesis, and then do 32 times 5 times 1, close parenthesis equals, okay? So as long as you keep this in parentheses, that should work. But what I do otherwise is each of these numbers needs to be divided. So I do them individually. So I have my top answer, and then I'm going to divide by 32. I'm going to hit equals. Then I'm going to divide by 5, and I'm going to hit equals, okay? So that's the way that I approach it. I'm going to divide by 1, technically, and then hit equals. That's how I approach it to get the right answer. And the answer I got in the calculator was 139.02625. But we do have to consider significant digits, okay? Your answer can only have the number of sig digs as the number you started with. So the 55.0 has three sig digs. Obviously, the fives are significant. That zero is significant because it adds some precision to the 55. It lets us know that we mean that 55 on the dot. We didn't round the 55. It wasn't 55.1. It was 55.0 on the dot, which means I get three sig digs. So my final answer is 139 grams of KNO3, okay? So there are um, some other videos with examples that I had some people you might recognize do related to stoichiometry. Um, so if you need to, consult those. And otherwise, keep working on topic three. Thanks.